Okay, so today we are looking at the end of World War One, the consequences of it leading into the signing of the Treaty of Versailles and the formation of the League of Nations. It's going to be fun. So World War One had left Europe utterly devastated. Every country who fought in the conflict had suffered massive casualties. For example, you've got Britain who lost 750,000 soldiers. In addition to that, 1.5 million British soldiers were wounded. France, they had uh, 1.4 million soldiers killed and 2.5 million wounded. Russia lost 1.7 million. Um, and even America, who had entered the war in 1917, only one year before the end of the war, had lost 116,000 soldiers. On the reverse side, even those obviously who fought against the Allies had suffered heavy casualties. Um, Germany lost 2 million soldiers, Austria-Hungary 1.2 million, Turkey 325,000 and Bulgaria lost 100,000 and these are some small countries. 100,000 people is a lot of people. The total deaths of all nations who fought in the war is thought to be approximately 8.5 million people, with an additional 21 million people being wounded. What you see on the right-hand side of your screen is an Australian war grave, um, and we can see around it that wreath of poppies. And the reason that we use poppies to commemorate World War I is because after all the fighting was done on the Western Front, these fields were just destroyed and utterly devastated and the only thing that grew on those fields was poppies so after the war when spring comes we just had these fields of poppies erupted and they just became naturally the flower that is used to commemorate those who were lost so the victors from world war one were in no mood to be charitable after war was over so after the armistice uh, particularly to the defeated nations and Germany. They were held most responsible for the war and for its consequences. The other thing to remember that sort of added to this feeling of bitterness was that during the mid-1918, which of course is the year that war ended, Europe was hit by Spanish flu and an estimated 25 million people died before the flu had passed, okay, before it had died out. This added to the feeling of bitterness that ran through Europe. Um, and again, it's primarily directed to those in Germany. Just what you see in this image here are nurses holding stretchers, preparing to take the ill and the dead to um, special quarantine areas because they quarantined those who were suffering from Spanish flu because it was so, so very contagious. This brings us to this Treaty of Versailles and this is the peace treaty that was signed at the end of World War I. Um, it is also worth noting that it was signed under the shadow of the Russian Revolution, which saw communists come into power in Russia, um, and it was the fall of their kind of monarchy system. So the treaty was signed at the vast Versailles Palace near Paris, hence its title, the Treaty of Versailles, between Germany and the Allies. The three most important politicians there were David Lloyd George, George Clemenceau, and Woodrow Wilson. The Versailles Palace was considered to be the most appropriate venue simply because of its size. Many hundreds of people were involved in this process and the final signing ceremony was held in the Hall of Mirrors because it was big enough to accommodate the hundreds of dignitaries who were in attendance. Many, many people wanted Germany, who was now led by Friedrich Herbert, smashed. Others, like Lloyd George, were privately more cautious in doing this. They were... Um, considering possible effects if they were to completely destroy Germany in terms of financial reparations and preventing them from having armies and things like that. You can see in this image on the left, you've got um, a man being held and that man is that kind of stereotypical German, okay? And he is being forced to swallow the bitter pill, which are, of course, in writing the peace terms, and is being held by the victors, those main powers. And you might not be able to read it, but the thumb says the British Empire, and beneath that you've got France, America, Italy, and Japan. Um, so, you know, it's worth millions of dollars, you've got to pay it, we're not going to, you know, do you have a choice, we're going to force you to do this. The treaty was signed on June 28th, 1919, after months of argument and, uh, and negotiation amongst those so-called Big Three as to what the treaty should contain. Now, the Big Three were David Lloyd George, 
who was the British Prime Minister at the time, George Clemenceau, who was the French leader at the time, and Woodrow Wilson, the US President at the time. So the treaty, like anything, does have consequences to it. It seemed to satisfy the big three, as in their eyes it was a just peace, as it kept Germany weak, yet strong enough to stop the spread of communism. It kept the French border with Germany safe from another German attack, and created the organisation, the League of Nations, that would end warfare throughout the world. However, it left a mood of anger throughout Germany, as it felt that it was the as a nation, sorry, they had felt that they were being treated unfairly. Above all else, Germany hated the clause blaming her for the cause of the war and the resultant financial penalties the treaty was bound to impose on her. Those who signed it, who, even though they had no choice, as we saw in the last slide, that bitter pill, um, became known as the November criminals and many German citizens felt that they were being punished for the mistakes of the German government in August 1914 as it was the government that had declared war, not the people. Uh, the photograph on the right was taken in 1933 at a Nazi-led protest against the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, and the sign that takes up the majority of the screen, the photo, sorry, tag von Versailles, tag der Embre, excuse my fabulous German, but basically that translates to day of Versailles, day of dishonour. And as I said, this is in 1933, okay? This is when Nazis are starting to really hit their stride. So this treaty has these lingering effects that lead straight into what's going to happen in World War II and its consequence. Um, as part of that, the Holocaust. So let's talk about this newly formed League of Nations. They came into being after the end of World War I, and their task was very simple, in essence, to ensure that war never broke out again. After the turmoil caused, caused by the Versailles Treaty, many looked to the League to bring stability to the world. America entered the war in World War I, uh, America entered World War I in 1917. The country as a whole, and the President Woodrow Wilson in particular, were horrified by the slaughter that had taken place in what was meant to be this incredibly civilised part of the world. Germany in particular was the hub of uh, music and culture and art and things like that. You know, we have such famous um, cultural icons like Mozart who've come out of that region. And so for that to be so disintegrated into this uncivilised slaughter was horrifying to the Americans. Um, and the only way to avoid a repetition of such a disaster was to create an international body whose sole purpose was to maintain world peace and which would sort out international disputes as and when they occurred. This would be the task of the League of Nations. After the devastation of the war, support for such a good idea was great. The only exception is America, who, being so far away geographically from Europe, felt quite isolated and they didn't have those ties like we do to the Commonwealth. So this idea of isolationism was really starting to take root. And you see that again when World War II breaks out. It takes to the bombing of Pearl Harbor before America will actually enter the war. So here's the question, were they successful? Their if their main goal was to stop all future outbreaks of war, we need to decide. They succeeded in preventing five serious conflicts, but they did not prevent six serious conflicts. So I want you to think about it. If that is their aim and that was the outcome, were they successful? I would like you to please write this in your book. So pause the video for three minutes, write it down, and then we'll resume. All right, pens down. So that's, that's their grand aims. But if we look, I want to look socially now at what they did. At a social level, the League did have success. And most of this is easily forgotten with its failure at a political level. Teams were sent to the third world to dig fresh water wells. The health organisation started a campaign to wipe out leprosy. Work was done in the third world to improve the status of women there and child slave labour were also targeted. Drug addiction and drug smuggling were also attacked. These problems are still with us today in the 21st century, so it would be wrong to criticise the League for failing to eradicate them. If we cannot do this now, the League, who had, far, the League had a far more difficult task then, but far fewer resources. 
The greatest success the League had involving these social issues was simply informing the world at large that these problems did exist and that they should be tackled. No organisation had done this before the League. And you've got to remember, this is a time well pre-Google. Uh, world press was not prevalent. Um, there was no evening news. The aeroplanes were very expensive and seldom used. This spread of information took a long time to occur. So people didn't know that these things exist. Uh, these social problems may have continued, but the fact that they were now being actively targeted and investigated by the League and were then taken on board by future organisations has to be viewed as a success. All right, so summing up. The League of Nations lasted for 26 years, from 1919 to 1946, when at the end of the Second World War, the organisation was disbanded. This was not because their work was done, but because of their political failings. Remember, they didn't stop six conflicts. In the wake of the League, a new organisation was created, and it does still exist today. One which acts all over the world, working to establish education, equal rights, healthcare, and of course, prevent and police the wars of the world. Can you take a guess? So we had the League of Nations, and taking over for them, of course, was the United Nations. Thanks, guys. I hope you have learnt oodles and that this wasn't too boring and not too weird that I've talked to you through a PowerPoint. Have fun. Bye.